Amen. So glad that you're all here today. I want to say hello to our guests. We're so glad you're with us. Can we all welcome them today? We hope you get a good picture of our campus community today, and of course, we hope that you choose to join us sometime in the future. I'm Linda Leon. I'm the Director of Spiritual Formation, and I'm a pastor on campus, and you're at Community Worship. It's one of our spiritual formation opportunities called SFOs on campus, and we have large group and small group type gatherings all through the semester. At Community Worship, we normally would have a message, a speaker, um, and a sermon, but this semester we're trying some different things. Um, so today we're going to have a panel of guests, uh, colleagues who I also call friends here. This semester, our focus is on living the Lord's Prayer. It's the entire semester. We're covering topics that you all suggested that you wanted to hear about when we took a survey last fall. And today's panel questions are also directly taken from things that you asked us about. So living the Lord's Prayer, last week, um, one of our professors, Drew Mazer, preached on the phrase, Our Father. And so we're going to also focus on that first phrase of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, today. And specifically, we're going to talk to our guests about what it means for them to relate to God, relate to God as Father, and also what it means to engage the Lord in Scripture. Like, how do you actually look at Scripture, read at Scripture, incorporate it into different ways in your life. And so the three friends I'd like to welcome today are Melody Scott, Dr. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so each guest needs to have that much tearing, just so you know. Dr. Christina Schneiders. <laughs> and Brian Hollingsworth. And I just want to note, when I said my name, nobody cheered. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, thanks. I love you too, Bella. Um, so I consider all of these three, the, these three people my friends, as well as my colleagues. They all serve as vice presidents and on the president's cabinet, Dr. Miller. Of course, as our president is in the front row today. So I've asked them to introduce themselves in a specific way. I'd like you to, you already gave your name, but what was your undergrad major? And what did you actually think you'd be doing upon college graduation? And then what are you actually doing now? Sure. Uh, well, as uh, Linda said, I'm Brian Hollingsworth. I'm the Vice President for Advancement. And uh, when I went to Malone, I graduated in 2002, and my undergraduate degree was Communication Arts with an emphasis in Journalism. Yep. Shout out to Com. Um, Marsh always made sure we said Communication Arts. That's the full title. Um, so I uh, was planning to uh, go out from Malone and become a journalist. Um, I also had a, a side uh, thought that I would become an improv comedian. Um, so um, both of those uh, directions, I, I didn't go in those directions. Um, I uh, chose to uh, start to work at a, a children's hospital in communications, and then I learned about uh, philanthropy, and I've just been working in philanthropy for about 18 years, and I, and I love it. It's all about still communicating with people and helping connect them to what's important to them and, and letting them know about your mission. So that's what I do at Malone. I, I uh, lead the fundraising uh, team and, and help connect people to the mission of Malone. Did I cover everything? Okay. Um, I am Dr. Christina Schneiders. I serve here as provost, um, which is a, a strange term that essentially means um, that I am the head of academic affairs. So I work with our faculty, <clears throat> and I also work with um, our registrar's office and the Center for Student Success, um, distance learning. Um, I have a lot of direct reports that I work with to help your experience be a great one here at Malone. I was an undergrad psychology major, um, and Literally the weekend that I graduated, I remember someone saying, what's your plan? And I said, well, my plan is to love people. And I don't really know what that's going to mean or look like. Um, and I was actually in an interview process for working at my college in their Office of Spiritual Formation um, and ended up taking that job for two years. Felt a real call to continue to move towards being some sort of helping professional. Um, and ended up through God and a group of really great friends from undergrad moving to Ashland, Ohio to go to seminary. Um, and that's kind of how I made it out here to Ohio and was pursuing a degree in counseling. So I am a licensed counselor. 
Um, and then actually through conversations with lots of people here at Malone, once I came as a resident director, including with Mel, yes, um, I really sensed a call to teach um, and ended up going to Kent and getting my PhD in counseling and came back um, and became a faculty member and through that kind of um, had many Pendle Hill moments, as we say, in discerning kind of where God wanted me to lead and serve, and that has led to me serving here as provost. If you, uh, so I was a ministry major at Malone University, Malone College then, um, and if you would have asked me upon graduation, I probably would have said something like, I'm just going to follow Jesus, and I'm not sure where that's going to lead. Uh, and I don't actually think that that answer has changed for me. Um, and so uh, at the time, I thought it would look like uh, working in full-time ministry inside the organized church uh, or overseas as a missionary or perhaps a Christian counselor. It was somewhere. Um, I knew that was sort of the leaning that I was receiving. And um, what's been fantastic is as vice president of student development, it kind of incorporates all those things, uh, a chance to um, teach scripture, a chance to be with people, to listen, um, to follow Jesus into other countries at times. There are service learning trips. Uh, and so it's been a, conglom a conglomeration really um, through the years. Thank you. Well, last week, as I mentioned, we heard a sermon on um, the phrase, Our Father in the Lord's Prayer. So what we did is we looked at Luke chapter 15 and a parable, a story called the parable, parable of the prodigal sons. And in that, we see a father actively pursuing two sons, both the younger one who took part of his inheritance and ran away, and then the older son who distanced himself from the father through pride. What I'd like to know is what is a way in the past or maybe the present that you have felt God the Father pursuing you and what did you learn about him as a result? In what way has God the Father pursued you and what did you learn? I'll go first again. Um, uh, so uh, I feel like um, God was pursuing me, leading me here to Malone. Um, I was working, um, you know, kind of in the corporate sector and uh, had had grown sort of um, questioning and discontent with um, sometimes the state of, of affairs. And um, so I, uh, through both, I think the pandemic kind of changing everything up and through uh, conversations with a couple different people, um, it led me to realize that I wanted to work in a place that would allow me to express my faith, um, n not just, you know, in kind of moments through t in time, but also just kind of overtly um, all the time, genuinely. So um, I feel like uh, God was pursuing me um, and kind of uh, used the pandemic as, as this kind of terrible, sometimes wonderful thing that, that kind of shook up all our, our expectations and led me to, to pursue God more and to draw closer to him, so. So I come from a divorced household. My parents divorced when I was six. And I think um, in a lot of ways, as I have explored the idea of God as father, it's really natural to think about relationships that we have with human mothers and fathers, human parents, right? As we're trying to learn things about God. And I think one of the ways that God has pursued me is by consistently reminding me of God's perfection as a father. Um, and that we have so many imperfect images of father that are based on real life experiences. Um, in my clinical practice, I often sat with people who really struggled with looking at God as father um, because of the relationships that they had had with, with an earthly father, with a parent, with a step parent, with a guardian, and those kinds of things. Um, and I, it is hard to sit with someone who is really in that space of struggle um, and to be in that space of struggle. And yet, um, I think for me, I have found God consistently pursuing me and reminding me that he as a father is perfect and pursues me as a father, as a loving and caring parent. Um, and as I was considering this, I want to share a brief story. I drive my kiddos to school every day. I have a son who's eight and a daughter who's seven. 
And I said to them, what have you learned about God from dad? You know, like, I'm just really curious. <laughs> and my son said, I really think God is a helper. God is really good at helping. And those of you who know my husband understand, like, he is a really wonderful person coming alongside, kind of helping people in times of need. That's, that's his passion. Um, and my daughter immediately said, God is a comforter. And she said, do you remember that one time when I was three and I got hurt at school and the teacher couldn't wait to talk to you because she said most of the time when a child this age gets hurt, they call for their mom, but Madison called for her dad. <laughs> um, and they have this beautiful special bond. And I think for me, hearing from children the ways that even imperfect people can embody the qualities and characteristics of a father, help point me toward, yeah, those are, that's right. God is kind, God is a helper, God pursues us, God is gracious towards us, God cares about us and comforts us. I think, when I think of the term pursuit, I don't know how I actually feel about that word because I have all sorts of images, I think, attached to pursuit that maybe are complicated, but, um, I think ultimately when I think about the pursuit of God and demonstrating his pursuit, it's in the person of Jesus going to the cross. I don't think there's any other story or idea or image of pursuit than God sending his son to die and be resurrected for us so that we could have reconciliation with God. Um, so there's that pursuit, I think, that overarches everything. But then God becomes really personal, too, and that our language is really limited. Um, and I just want to name, like, when we say God is Father, um, the language that we have to describe God is inadequate, um, but it's all we have. Um, and so God is Father, the framework that we approach, I think, is our earthly Father. We're assigning God, you know, human characteristics um, in the framework that we understand. And for people in the room, that might mean a lot of different things, right? Like, you might not even know your father, earthly father. You might not. You Maybe he was there and left uh, and abandoned you. Or maybe your father was your hero and fulfills a lot of different needs in your life. Um, maybe your father, like mine, was physically there but emotionally absent. Um, and so when I think about the pursuit, it's similar to what Christina said, that... I became um, enraptured with this idea of the perfect father because I had seen, while my dad had great characteristics, there was a lot of things missing, and I think it was in college where I first started to realize that I was assigning God the father attributes that I experienced in my earthly father, um, and one of those was silence. When I did something wrong, um, my dad would give the silent treatment, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks, sometimes a month. Um, and so when I disobeyed God or was in sin, I made this assumption that God was silent because that's how my earthly dad treated me. And I, it was through other people in relationships, and I think that's where the our father comes in, that it's this interpersonal interconnectedness with other people walking and following Jesus that actually slowly help reveal God's pursuit of us um, and his love for us. And so his pursuit started, or his pursuit of me started to become a slow unraveling of truth in my life about who he really was that shatters labels and boxes and understandings of earthly characteristics. Um, and that demonstration of a perfect father who gives good gifts um, that is beyond anything we experience in earthly father uh, is really, I think, where I, I've seen him show up in my life. I'm hearing, and I think you're probably hearing, that even seeing God as Father can be complicated. Um, and it's worth your uncovering of that in your own life. It's worth you taking the time to disentangle some of the things that were set up here, Aaron, say, you know, how you currently view God as Father, how does that connect to an earthly father or an earthly father figure in your life. And is that true? Is that connection true? Or does that need to be disentangled? 
so that you could approach God the Father differently. And that, is, that can be a really deep and sometimes really painful process. And so just wanted to add here that while you're here at Malone, there are people who will walk beside you and help you in uncovering that. Um, Office of Spiritual Formation, certainly the people on this stage, faculty, staff, residence hall directors, we have a counseling center. It's worth the uncovering. Um, I just met with an alum yesterday who's in her early 40s who is going through just this. Her father died, and so she has been able to, not been able to relate to God the Father because of not being able to grieve her earthly father. So it's, it's just worth it. You're worth that time. So I'd like to shift, and we have a slide that we can change to as well. I'd like to shift to um, how we better understand who God is through reading scripture. And just want to get a sense through your life. Um, what are spiritual practices that you've used to interact with the Bible? And how has this gone? Has it gone well? Has it not gone well? What does that look like? Brian, I think they're, oh, no, no, go ahead, Christina. <laughs> Start. Um, so I grew up in the church. Um, I was very familiar by the time I came to college. I went to a Christian college also with the stories of scripture, with the, the overarching story. Um, but I have found that there is something meaningful about praying scripture. Um, and a tool that has been really helpful for me is called Lectio Divina. Um, it's a way of praying through scripture where you take a verse even and multiple times pray and ask God to communicate with you through that scripture. One of the reasons that I find that to be really meaningful and helpful is that as an academic, I can be really in my head. And um, we train you well, right, to use your brains to the glory of God here at Malone University. And we want to do that. But also, there's a way of encountering God in scripture. And sometimes that feels like an aha moment where you've read a verse hundreds of times and yet something stands out to you in that. And I think slowing down and praying and asking God to speak to you through that scripture um, is a really helpful way of looking at scripture, not just through the lens of the mind, but also the soul and the spirit, connecting your whole self to the scripture. Um, and so if you're interested in more information about Lectio Divina, you can talk to people in the Office of Spiritual Formation, myself, many of us use that as a tool. Um, that's, a good, that's a loaded question, I think, because I think there's been different seasons that have approached scripture in different ways. I would say that the Word of God is the one anchor in my life um, that surpasses any other anchor, largely because when I read Scripture, it changes me. It changes my thinking. It changes my understanding of God. Um, I can read the same verse sometimes at different seasons of my life, and it can mean something very different to, than, to me than maybe the previous time I read it. So it's living. And I think it's been the stabilizing factor for me when I think about there's so much that changes, you know, in my wisdom, my thoughts, what I think about subjects and topics changes and evolves. And um, the word of God remains that thread in my life that grounds me uh, and helps me approach other people with a different posture. Um, and so reading it becomes a really important part of my life, and I started really early on with devotional books because when I, I didn't understand when I first got scripture that it wasn't linear, that like we read every book from the beginning to the end and it's a story, and the Bible isn't linear. It doesn't go in order. You can get Bibles that are chronological so it, or attempts to put it in a chronological order, but it's not. And so that was super confusing to me um, as I approached it. Uh, but I use devotionals first, which if you don't know what a devotional is, it's usually uh, a scripture and then somebody gives you a story or unpacks that scripture in another book. And, uh, and so I started with devotionals. Um, and then I realized I wanted to read the actual word of God, like cover to cover. And so I would find a plan. Um, there's all sorts of plans you could find online that teaches you how to read it in a year. Uh, it gives you sections of the Bible to read in a year or thematically helps you read it through in a year. But through different seasons of my life, I think I've also um, read it differently. Like one year, 
Um, I read it out loud in my room by myself because I just thought it carries a different weight when you hear it out loud. And I'm sure people passing by, because I was here at Malone when that would happen, probably thought, who is she talking to? But I was just reading scripture out loud as part of my devotion. Another year, I read it on my knees. Um, every day, I would just get on my knees and read it in a posture of submission. Um, and so my posture, I think, has impacted my Bible reading. And then I've found additional resources to help me understand it. And finding a version that you understand at the beginning, because um, there's a lot of different uh, translations of Scripture. So finding something that I could read and actually understand um, was really crucial, too, that made sense to me. Uh, but, but reading the Word of God shapes me, changes me, inspires me, empowers me. Um, and helps me understand who God is in a better way to integrate into my life. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll share. Um, uh, so I, I used to really beat myself up about um, struggling with reading the Bible because it's never come completely easy to me. Uh, my wife is, um, she knows the Bible back to front. It's always, she's been really good at it. But I've always struggled, you know, I'm, I'm not an early morning person. So, you know, the thought of like, you know, getting up at, at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. and trying to, to read the Bible during that time. It's never been something that I've been able to do, and I've kind of beat myself up about it. But I then have come to realize that the important thing is that you do it and that you're disciplined about it and you find what works for you. So uh, right now I, I read a, a chapter a day um, at 12.30 at night, which is um, when I'm kind of getting ready for, for bed. And then um, for accountability, I upload it to a Facebook group that I'm, I'm a part of with an accountability partner. So uh, I found that that helps to, me to every day read the Bible at a time that's good for me, and I'm sharing it with someone else, and I hope that he's inspired by it. But regardless, he also just helps keep me accountable. So um, I read a whole book about discipline and you know, discipline is doing something repeatedly so that you have room for other things in your life. And that has helped me a lot. So That's thank you. Really good. Thank you. I hope you're seeing that um, engaging with scripture can be unique as you are. And that's why we put together the, the web page that you'll see up there. If you want to snap a pic of it, it's going to go away soon, the QR code, so we can sing one more song. But a lot of what they mentioned, the Bible reading plans are ways to approach the Bible. We've loaded up onto that web page. And then also, your spiritual formation staff people are super nerdy when it comes to spiritual practices. We love to help people to figure out, like, who am I and how can I approach this faith thing? So please, always, you can email or you can stop by our office. We're going to stand and sing one more song. But before we do that, would you please say thank you to our guests today? Thank you.